Described as, and I quote, the most powerful woman in entertainment and one of the 50 most powerful women in business and one of the world's 100 most powerful women, it is more than a privilege to have Ann Sweeney with us here today. It is an opportunity. Ann is the co-chair of Disney Media Networks and president of Disney slash ABC TV Group. She oversees a thriving global business with nearly 10,000 employees worldwide that entertains and influences hundreds of millions of people each month. As a leader, an influencer of so many, and a known innovator in her industry, there's a lot we as business owners and entrepreneurs can learn from Anne. Anne, welcome to Success. Thrilled you could take the time out of your, what must be a very busy schedule, to sit down with us today. Oh, thank you, Darren. I'm excited to be here. So let's start uh, by talking about your success. You've had quite the uh, success in your role with Disney. Share with us what you think the number one contributing factor to the success you've had with the Disney brand has been since you joined the organization uh, all the way back in 1996. Darren, I think the number one key to success here at Disney and really in every business is the team. It is all about putting together the best team possible, the smartest people, the people who are risk takers, the people who really treasure and understand our brand. And I think, you know, more than anything, continue to be curious about its future and do everything that they do with a high degree of integrity. Well, I agree, and it's a very important topic, and I was going to save this for later, but you've started down this path, uh, and I really want to go there with you. We we all know that the businesses, um, brands or products or magazines for that, right, are really just people, right? People serving people. So give us the tip for handpicking the best team, keeping them, and then continually drawing the best out of them day in and day out. Well, starting with the brand, and making sure that everyone understands it, and I'm really speaking specifically about our team, a brand is quite simply the relationship you have with your consumers, with your viewers, with your customers. And the important thing for every team to remember is that that relationship is paramount. Not only keeping that relationship fresh and vital and exciting and relevant, but making sure that that relationship means something in their lives. So that's where I start. When it comes to actually picking the people who will execute the different pieces related to our brands, the different activities, whether it's television production or marketing or the development of stories or characters, I look for people who have a high degree of integrity and a high degree of curiosity, because I find that people who are, who are curious are always pushing their own limits. You never have to set a high bar because they're so engaged, they're so invested that they're going to keep pushing themselves harder than you could ever push them. The other piece that's so important to me is that they feel a true responsibility to one another. And one of the things that we say in our team meetings is we are stapled to each other. And the success of Disney Channel is related to the success of ABC, of ABC Family, of our television production businesses, of every single piece of the Disney ABC television group and how that relates to the Walt Disney Company. I know that one of the greatest obstacles that leaders who are trying to do great work in the world face are naysayers and people who, you know, just try to tear down anybody that is trying to do great things in the world. So I'm sure like most successful people, you've had to deal with a variety of different negative situations in your day to day work. Talk about how you handle some of the more negative situations as a leader and how you avoid letting it affect you so that you can stay positive and motivated and continue to do your great work. Well, I I think my team and I are so lucky because we work for a brand. We work for Disney, and Disney symbolizes an optimistic attitude. It's always been aspirational. It's always been about the place where dreams come true, and that is a motivating factor every single day. And I think because of this brand, we're able to blow past a lot of negativity. I mean, I think every business is faced with naysayers, people who don't believe in you. But we've always felt that if we believed in our work, if we believed in each other and supported each other, we could blow past 
everything and be successful. You know, I, I often feel overwhelmed by the amount that I've got to manage and oversee as part of my day-to-day -day role, but I can't even imagine what it must be like for you. So I'm really curious about this. And we, we talked about it in your cover story and the introduction about how you oversee ABC Television Network, Disney Channels Worldwide, Radio Disney, ABC Family, and the list goes on and on, and not to mention the number of speaking engagements and panels that I see you on and all the charitable efforts that you're involved with. Share your secret for managing it all. How do you stay productive when you have an agenda that I'm, I'm sure is a mile long? Well, I start with our goals, and our boss, Bob Iger, the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company, has been very clear. We have three big goals. It is our creative content. It's using technology to help us drive that creative content, and it's the growth of international. And we add to that the growth of our culture and the education of the team that works with us. So starting with goals enables you to have strong priorities. And I'm lucky because when I look at my calendar, all of our businesses have their big moments, fortunately, at different times of the year. So for example, I know right now, we are just about through the development season for the ABC television network for next fall. So I have spent a tremendous amount of time with Paul Lee, our head of entertainment, who also oversees ABC Studios, on not only his strategy, but all of the creative projects that have been coming through the door that he's excited about, that he'd like to see on our air at some point over the next year or two. So that's been a very big focus. ABC Family is gearing up for all of its launches in January. So I know that's coming down the road. There are certain times of the year when we do our annual operating plan and our five-year plan, which are wonderful exercises for the group because it helps set our strategy going forward, short and long-term. Uh, and Disney Channels Worldwide just continues really as a 365-day business. They are constantly creating, and all of our channels throughout all of the different countries and territories where they exist continue to produce on a daily basis new and exciting properties for us. So I do have a sense of my calendar. I'm able to prioritize because I understand the big goals of our company. Yeah, I really love how you put that. Starting with your goals, and you've got three big goals, it allows you to have clear priorities. So I hope our very busy and seemingly, you know, endlessly overwhelmed entrepreneurs heard that really great advice. So let's talk about uh, your priority number two. Part of what you do is keeping up with the changes in the industry and in technology. So explain your tactics for keeping pace with the ebb and flow of the media business and the varying technologies that are coming out and how you stay on that bleeding edge. I have one short story and uh, actually a, a great note about my team. For almost the last 18 years, I've worked with a wonderful guy named Vince Roberts, who is head of our broadcast operations and engineering. And Vince, on a very regular basis, would walk into my office and put a new device on my desk and say, this is what it is and you should play with this and you should figure out what you like and what you don't like about this, and is this something that's useful for us? Or I would go down to our operations center and, and Vince would show me some new equipment that was put in, or he'd show me a new piece of software. So I realized after a couple of years that I had a very important mentor who was very focused on making sure that I was educated, not just about technology, but that I was attuned to change in our industry. This proved to be enormously helpful because in 2005, my boss called me and said, Steve Jobs would like to talk to you. I thought, that's really cool. I've always wanted to talk to Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs called to say, I have a new device and I'd like to talk to you about it. It's called the Video iPod. So Steve and his team came down to Burbank. They demoed the video iPod for us. They showed us how video would work in the iTunes store. And it was, it was fantastic. 
I sat there watching Lost, holding Lost in my hand. I remember the, the video iPod was slightly larger than the iPhones we all use today. But it was one of those moments when you realize there really isn't a business plan that we can write for this. We really can't project how this will do. But it was that moment. It was that moment where we had to be willing to take that risk. We had to be willing to make that jump. We had to be willing to face whatever criticism would arise about making this move toward portable television. So we made the move. And as a result, not only were we the first in the industry to put television shows on the video iPod, but we started to learn what the next chapter of television would look like. The next chapter of television would become mobile, it would become very personal, and it would require us to think very differently about everything that we did. I read where you told someone that you're not guided by a carefully laid plan. Instead, you follow your curiosity. And that seems like that could bring amazing results, but also be a little dangerous at times. Talk about the uh, the ups and downs of, of following your curiosity and when it has brought you success and maybe when it has tripped you up a bit and taught you a big lesson. You know, I think curiosity has served me well. My curiosity does not uh, gazump the five-year plan or the annual operating plan. We do make our numbers and we're always intent on beating our numbers. But I do think that curiosity has worked in our favor because part of being curious is actually sitting down with your audience and finding out what they're curious about or finding out what's missing. And I've been so fortunate this year when I've traveled to both India and China, our teams were able to organize visits for me into local schools. When I was in India, I met with high school students. And when I was in China recently, I was fortunate enough to be in a classroom of second and third graders. And that was absolutely amazing to me. One of the first questions we asked kids, you know, very simply, do you have a television? And everyone very politely raised their hands. Do you watch television? And the responses were, were all about the same. Yes, I watch television, but not during the school week. I do homework when I get home. Uh, but I watch sometimes on Friday nights and on weekends. And then we asked the question that caused the room to erupt. Do you have an iPad? Every single kid. Do you have an iPhone or do you have a smartphone? Every single kid. And I asked them the question, what do you do on your iPad? And now, I'll be honest with you, I was thinking they would answer play games because I was thinking you're watching television on your television, you would be playing games on your iPad. But no, when I asked them what they did on their iPad, they said, I watch television. And that was a revelation for all of us because we realized that the number one thing we have to do is understand what our audience is doing with these devices, not what we want to do with these devices. We are the ones who have to adjust our strategy to answer what the consumer needs, not the consumer adjusting to us. Well, speaking of these great changes, you talk about how television is now being delivered to smaller devices, it's being delivered mobile, it's becoming much more personal. Another big change is that it is going from being a passive experience to a very active one, sometimes very, very active. Tell us how you think this has improved things for you and your brand, and then also how it might have hindered the business model you have and, and kind of what you see going forward. Give us a, a, a view over the horizon about what you see with this trend. Well, you know, it, it's interesting, Darren. I, I often say if you want to know what the future will look like, ask a kid. And I think kids really showed us the way forward in this area. We produced a show some years ago, and we still produce it. It's still on Disney Junior and Disney Channel called Mickey Mouse's Clubhouse. And wonderful episodes, very engaging, our core characters who everyone knows and loves. And someone in our group had the idea to create a Mickey Mouse Clubhouse episode. And took an episode of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and did an overlay using new software, voice-activated technology, 
and really made it an interactive experience for kids. Now, this happened because we had been in focus groups, you know, we're in focus groups all the time talking to kids, but we were talking to very young kids one day and watching them as they were answering questions. And we realized as they were answering questions that they were talking with their hands and their, their hands were telling us that they were swiping, they were pointing, they were dragging. And this was something that we didn't expect from this young age group until we realized, well, they probably didn't have smartphones at the age of four and five, but they had parents or caregivers or friends who were handing them their smartphones. And they were developing their skills and also their expectations of technology at a much earlier age than we realized. Yeah, they're called digital natives. They're growing up with this as a norm. And they're not, they are. Yeah, they're not even uh, shocked or overwhelmed by how fast things are progressing and things are changing. That, that's their norm. And it's the, exactly right. So now that has to become our norm as well. Exactly. It's uh, and it's hard. You know, some of us old dogs learning new tricks. It's a lot more difficult than those that are coming by it very organically. I read a quote where you said, "The smartest thing you could ever do is to constantly ask questions, and especially when you're uncertain or you're trying to do something new." Certainly, Socrates would agree with you. But guide us through this process, uh, and and what are the best kinds of questions to be asking? You know, I think that there, there are many good questions to ask, and they fall into a couple of buckets. One bucket is, you know, what I don't know or understand. And, and for me, in the early days of, of working with new technology, it was all about understanding how things worked. The second bucket is really related to the consumer. What is the consumer doing? And, and our most successful research with kids and with our audience is not, do you like this television show or that television show? The better questions are around, what is your life like? What time do you get home from school? What do you do when you get home from school? What games do you like to play? Do you play sports? Where do you play these sports? And one of my favorite questions that a study that we have often used asks is, who are your heroes? And it was very interesting the first time I read the results to this question. I was expecting all kinds of superheroes. And instead, kids answered, mother, father, brother, and sister which was very powerful because it reaffirmed not just for me, but for everyone on our team, the importance and the power of the Disney brand. So nearly two decades being the steward of this incredible brand and all these experiences that you've had and the people that you've had a chance to work with, if there's one lesson that we all remember as a result of this dialogue we've had today that would help other entrepreneurs, business leaders, people who are trying to do great things in the world, that you could draw from your nearly two decades uh, leading Disney. What do you think that most important lesson that you've learned that could be passed along to somebody listening today? You know, I, if I could have two lessons, I, I think the first would be don't be afraid to fail because failure is such a good guide to success. I've learned so much from good, honest mistakes that we've made as a company. And the second lesson, enjoy the problems. You know, I, I, I have to remind myself to fully enjoy our successes because the truth is I enjoy our problems and challenges so much because I feel that that's where we can see the opportunities that are ahead for our business. You know, give me an impossible deal. Give me a technology that we can't get our arms around. You know, give me a, a personnel issue, give me an organizational issue, because those are the things that get me excited about the future. If we can solve this, if we can make this problem or this challenge into a learning experience for our team, we're better for it. We're a stronger company and we're not afraid of the next challenge because we've used today's challenge to be ready for tomorrow. Well, Ms. Ann Sweeney, what a delight this has been. You are such a great ambassador to your very special brand. Thank you so much for being such a great